Holy smokes. Uh, <laughs> that was wild. The place that I am walking out of right now was something else. Um, this is the Glore Psychiatric Museum in St. Joseph, Missouri, which is the, the former site of Missouri State Lunatic Asylum number two. And I, I typically don't show, you know, the end at the beginning, uh, but this place is wild and what I saw and what I learned in here uh, is something else. So uh, anyway, this is definitely one to watch all the way to the end. Okay, so we just got in here into the museum, and uh, what we're looking at here is an aerial shot of State Hospital Number 2, which was opened in 1874 here in St. Joseph, Missouri. Here's a large picture of some of the people who worked at State Hospital Number 3. Uh, so, again, we're at State Hospital Number 2. Um, and this is kind of shocking. Uh, this is a uh, restraint cage that was used at uh, State Hospital number three, uh, the one in Fulton. And uh, yeah, this would be used to hold patients who were possible threats. Interesting. All right, we're entering into the museum now. And uh, as you're walking in, they have this quote that I think is worth reflecting on. It says, every individual who has a brain is liable to insanity, precisely as everyone who has lungs is liable to pneumonia. That's a very good way to, to think about uh, mental illness. If we're talking about the history of the treatment of mental illness, uh, we really have to talk about Dorothea Dix. Uh, this is a woman who in the 1840s was living in Massachusetts and uh, really had a, a lot of compassion on the, the mentally ill who she was seeing in, uh, in her own state and uh, started advocating for them and advocating for reforms to um, you know, have standards of treatment uh, so that they wouldn't be abused in the way that, that she was seeing. Here's a, another guy who's kind of a pioneer in the treatment of uh, the, the mentally ill. This is a guy by the name of uh, Thomas Kirkbride. And he came up with this plan for these asylums where if you look kind of like at these blueprints, you'll notice that there's a, a little bit of a staggered design uh, in the building layout. Uh, well, this was to try and maximize the amount of airflow and light that could reach the patients who were staying in these asylums. So, uh, again, we're in State Lunatic Asylum number two. Uh, this is the grand staircase that was in the asylum, as well as uh, the original chandelier. Uh, there, there was a fire that destroyed uh, a lot of the original stuff, and they had to, of course, rebuild. Uh, but these are a few of the original items that would have been here in the state hospital. Okay, we're going to start from the bottom. Uh, we're going to go downstairs first and uh, see what there is to see. So 
So this is something that's kind of interesting to me. Uh, whenever you think of uh, an insane asylum, you might have visions in your head of people just sitting around in chairs with white walls and playing checkers all day and things like that. Uh, well, here at uh, Lunatic Asylum Number 2, uh, they had, you know, different shops where people could create things. So here are some weather vanes that some of the patients created. Um, they also had, as you can see here in this picture, uh, a farm on site. So there would be some patient labor where they would, you know, have chores and uh, they would grow stuff on a farm. Uh, and by doing that, the, the patients who worked on the farm could have a, a little bit of pride. They're not only uh, contributing to the efforts to feed themselves, but they're also contributing to the uh, the hospital staff and the, the community and having a sense of purpose. Here's a cafeteria table that, that would have been here at uh, the state hospital as well. And, and something that I wouldn't have really even thought about, but that they mentioned, is that it's made from super heavy materials. And uh, the reason for that is that if somebody uh, decided to uh, jump up on the, the table, uh, well, it wouldn't tip over or disturb the other people. We're going to move to the area where they talk about some of the treatments here in a moment, but first, I'm going to take a look in the morgue here. Uh, now, one thing that I saw on their orientation video for this museum, uh, they said was what they would tell some families, and this is so sad, uh, they would tell them, um, for your relative, bring the clothes that you want them to be buried in because they will likely never leave. Um, just a, a pretty sad ordeal. But anyway, here's um, a cooler here for the morgue, and then, oh, dang. Okay. So... Yeah, they have a little table here to uh, perform autopsies. And then it looks like have some remains of some headstones that were in the hospital cemetery. Huh. Not something that you really think about whenever you think of um, a, a mental health facility. Okay, heading upstairs now. Have you ever heard of something called pika? I know that I haven't. I've heard of a Pikachu, uh, but as it says here, pika is an appetite for non-nutritive substances that persists for more than one month at an age when eating such objects is considered developmentally inappropriate. Uh, so here's the story. There was a lady here, who, uh, a patient who died in 1929, and whenever they did her autopsy, they found 1,446 objects in her stomach. Uh, things like nails, and bolts and safety pins and uh, looks like buttons and thimbles just all kinds of things that this woman had ate and was in her stomach that is absolutely wild uh, it says here that there were needles in her stomach um, <laughs> there was a broken coat rack hook. Oh my gosh. So uh, originally it was thought that people did this because there was something in their diet that they weren't getting. Maybe they weren't getting enough iron. Uh, but now we would say that this is probably uh, more associated with an obsessive compulsive disorder. Here we're looking at some uh, psychosurgery tools, and they also tell the story of a guy by the name of Phineas Gage, who um, in 1848 was using dynamite to you know, remove some objects, 
and uh, the, the blast blew a steel rod through his dang head. Uh, now, this isn't the actual steel rod. This is a replica. But here is a picture of uh, Phineas Gage. Uh, he ended up surviving, but um, a lot of his left frontal lobe was destroyed, and it affected his personality and his behavior, uh, which uh, you, you might expect. Um, and this was uh, one of the, the first links that was established between brain trauma and personality change. What we are looking at here is a uh, surgical table where they would perform lobotomies and uh, dead gum. Look at this. So this is called a transorbital or ice pick lobotomy where the, the doctor would lift up the upper eyelid and then drive this dead gum thing called an orbitoclast, which was a, a thin surgical instrument, under the eyelid and to the top of the eye socket, and then use a hammer to drive it through a thin layer of bone and into the brain. And then it was pivoted to either side of the eye socket to sever connective tissue to the brain. My gosh. A lot of the patients here at the uh, state hospital would have come in with syphilis uh, and these are fever cabinets so you would sit in there and you would have your head poking out the top kind of like uh, this individual right here and then there were these high wattage bulbs that would raise your body temperature to above 105 degrees and uh, this was supposed to be a cure for syphilis kind of an uncomfortable cure I would imagine uh, fever therapy ended up being replaced by penicillin in the late 1940s. This is a concept that will probably be familiar to people just from what you might see in, uh, in movies. Uh, this is ECT, which is electroconvulsive therapy. Uh, this is something that was developed in 1938 to treat mental illness and uh, would, would basically cause the, the patient to have a seizure. Uh, the problem is whenever they first started doing this, the patient would be fully awake. So uh, there would be some, some pretty painful and, and scary side effects. Um, yeah, but anyway, it, it's still used to treat severe depression, uh, whether you realize it or not, except for they put the patient under now instead of having it uh, while you're awake. Um, but yeah, interesting. Uh, here's an artifact from the colonic irrigation room. Hmm. Uh, this is kind of interesting. Uh, this is the the sedative bathroom. Uh, so this is kind of like a, a hydrotherapy that was used in asylums and hospitals uh, to treat, you know, agitated patients. So the, you know, the idea is that a, a warm bath had a, a soothing and relaxing quality to it. Uh, and you, you might wonder why is this person covered up um, and just has their head poking out. Uh, well, this is a, a piece of canvas to try and uh, maintain the temperature of the water. And then here they have some thermometers that were used here at this hospital. This one actually makes sense to me. Uh, and then they also have um, a cold pack treatment, which would involve wrapping the patient in, in cold sheets uh, and then covering a, the patient with a, a woolen blanket. It was intended to, to calm them. Here's a display showing some different types of restraints that have been used historically with uh, mentally ill patients. Uh, so you might have some uh, that like restrain a person to a chair uh, or uh, maybe you have mitts uh, to keep them from harming themselves or harming others. Um, they also had this thing right here. This was a restraint cuff and you can see here's a picture of it being used. 
so, so the hands are tied with uh, leather straps within this cuff. Um, and, and there are still, you know, extreme cases today where people have to be restrained uh, in order to keep from hurting themselves or hurting others. Here's the one that seems a little bit extreme. <laughs> they call this um, early tranquilizers. And it's really just a, a strap that you beat somebody with. Uh, so if somebody's having a manic episode, uh, yeah, the, the way to get them to calm down is just to smack them with one of these things. That doesn't seem effective. Uh, I think that would make things a little bit worse. Okay, uh, as we're going through here, I, I really want to be careful with something. Uh, some of the things that we're seeing seem, by today's standards, quite barbaric. Uh, but, but what you have to understand, and, and maybe have a little historic empathy uh, for, is that in a lot of cases, these doctors were, were learning, uh, and they were doing the, the best that they could with what they had. And who knows, uh, 50, 60, 100 years from now, people might look back at our era and look at how, with a lot of mental health patients, uh, we heavily medicated them, and they might look at us and say, how, how barbaric, how could they have done such a thing? So anyway, uh, maybe as we're looking through this, I uh, need to have a, a little bit of understanding and a little bit of empathy and, and kind of learn from it. All right, got, got some other interesting looking things right up here. Oh, got a little television here with a whole bunch of letters stacked in it. Uh, so in the fall of 1971, there was a male patient here who was observed sticking a piece of paper into the back of this TV. So they, they got the electrician to turn off the TV and open it up, and they found 525 pieces of paper and letters stuffed into this TV. Uh, the, the patient had a lot of delusions. Uh, you know, he thought that uh, the hospital was stealing his money and that his knowledge was hidden away in a couple of boxcars uh, and that he, he couldn't leave the hospital until all of this uh, was exposed. So we, we don't know if he was storing them in the TV or if he thought he was mailing them or if he thought that the information was being transmitted through the television set. But uh, anyway, very, very interesting. And here you can see an example of one of the, the letters that he, or one of the piece of, pieces of paper that he had shoved in this TV. Fascinating. This is pretty interesting. Uh, so there was one patient here who thought that he needed to collect cigarette packs and that if he collected a hundred thousand cigarette packs, uh, he could exchange them for a new wheelchair for the hospital. So um, the <laughs> these are all of the cigarette packs that he collected. Um, his life collection ended up being 108,000 cigarette packs. That is a lot of smoking uh, that was going on. Uh, but on November 19th of 1969, the hospital administration presented him with a new wheelchair uh, for the, the unit uh, as a token of appreciation for all of the hard work that he put into collecting. And then here's a, another individual here who um, was really into ties. So this is that person's tie collection. And hey. <laughs> When does collecting become a disorder? That feels like a personal attack. Okay, moving into the next room, and what in the heck is going on in here? Huh. Looks like somebody is being uh, burned at the stake. Okay, so, so yeah, I guess what they're talking about here 
is um, how maybe in the, in the distant past, people who had mental illnesses were maybe accused of being demon-possessed or, or being witches and uh, were burned at the stake. Now, again, this is one of those things where I was talking about we need to have uh, some, some empathy and some understanding for the, the people of history and the people of the past. This is something called a Utica crib. So, again, this is another apparatus that is kind of like a, a cage to keep people restrained. And we might look at this and say, man, that is just barbaric as heck, uh, you know, to put somebody in there and, and lock them up. And that would maybe... Uh, cause uh, additional uh, stress or agitation. But there was a mentally ill patient who was quoted in a, a journal in 1846 who slept in one of these cribs for several days and said that he had rested better and found it useful. And here's his quote. He says, for, quote, all crazy fellows as I, whose spirit is willing, but whose flesh is weak. So, this system of confinement actually gave him rest because he wouldn't get up in the middle of the night and wander around. Hmm. Here are a few other items in this room. So here they have uh, part of a, uh, so, or some bars rather, from uh, a steel cage called a man cage that was taken from the St. Louis City poorhouse. This should look familiar. This is something that we commonly associate with, you know, restraining criminals in the town square, but could also be used for uh, or has been used for mental health patients, you know, the stocks. <laughs> this is a treatment that they had in the 16th uh, and 17th century where uh, if you had melancholy or if you had a phobia, well, they just put you in a bucket and blast you with uh, ice cold water. And then here uh, is another restraint cage. And then there's this thing right here. So this is a like a giant hamster wheel um, called the hollow wheel. It was designed by a German psychiatrist uh, named Johann Riel. Um, and the, the idea is that it's kind of like a, a treadmill. So they would take the, the person who is, you know, having problems and put them in this door and lock them inside. And then they could either run forward or they could run backward. Uh, but you're in this giant hamster wheel all by yourself. And the, the idea was that you would focus on one thing for an extended period of time. And it would divert your attention from, you know, whatever was mentally ailing you. And uh, it says here on this thing that they could be in there for 36 to 48 hours. Man, this now this just seems cruel. This is something. This is a reproduction of something called a lunatic box uh, that was sometimes called the, the English booth um, or or the coffin. Uh, so this was used during the 18th and 19th centuries, and the individual would be placed inside this device and had to remain in a standing position until they calmed down. And then, uh, if you don't want to, you know. Uh, bear witness to their craziness anymore. Well, you could just turn these screws and, and drop this down to where uh, they couldn't look out and uh, you didn't have to look in. But they would have to, like, stand in their own excrement and, oh, yeah, awful. This is something that was developed by Benjamin Rush, who is called the father of psychiatry. And uh, this is called a tranquilizer chair. So if you have somebody who um, is uh, distressed or needs to become calm, well, you would put them in this device and their head would go in here and then their arms and legs would be strapped down. And then there's a little bucket there to capture their waist. And um, <laughs> basically you're here and they may put leeches on you or something like that or do bloodletting or you would just sit there until you calm down. Nothing would calm me down more than being strapped to a chair and having my face covered up and people putting leeches on me. Here they're showing uh, some different ways that, that people have been treated in the past, uh, you know, with restraints or here are some other 16th and 17th century uh, restraining devices. Uh, or here's here's another treatment. How, how about we just get the patient down on the ground and uh, we, we stomp the problems out of them. Uh, dear heavens, <laughs> that, 
what the heck? This is fascinating. This is some embroidery work that was done by a woman who uh, had schizophrenia and she was mostly mute um, and was hospitalized for over 30 years and uh, this was how she communicated I guess. Um, so it, it was thought for years that the the words sewn on here were um, just psychotic but there was some research that was done later on and they found that this woman may have been more connected with her environment than what people originally thought. Wow. Here's something that is really interesting and uh, kind of adds a, a human element to this whole place. They have a lot of art displayed from the patients here at State Hospital Number 2. Uh, this is a quilt that the patients made as a gift to a nurse who was having to resign because uh, she was having a baby. And if you look here, it says, made by Girls Ward 20, January, and that's uh, 1960. They have uh, some other pieces of art on display here. So, so I'm gonna stop talking for a second and uh, show some of these pieces and let them speak for themselves. I think that this is a good way to kind of wrap up our time here. It says, one in five Americans are affected by mental health conditions. What is a stigma? It's a set of negative and often unfair beliefs that a society has about something. And here's how you can help break the stigma. Educate yourself and others, which is what we're doing here. Encourage others to help break the stigma. See the person, not the condition. Four, telling them how common mental illness is. And five, talking openly about mental illness. Yeah, this place is something else. All right, well that was the Glore Psychiatric Museum right here in St. Joseph, Missouri. Uh, I forgot to mention, it's named after a guy named Glore who was an employee here uh, at the uh, state asylum and um, felt passionately about educating the public and and uh, you know teaching people about you know mental illness and, and destigmatizing it and that that place is is really really something else I, I learned a lot there uh, I, I'm not so much you know shocked at the the mental illness part as I am some of the treatments that they had but again you know people were just kind of making their way and figuring out things as best they could but uh, yeah, if you're ever through St. Joseph, come to this place. That, that was something else. We are constantly exploring and learning new things on this channel. So if you found value in this video, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell to catch all of the new content when it comes out. And be sure to check the links in the description for more content and opportunities from our partners.